going to talk to you about two different things in the, the opening up of some ideas for this capacity building session. First of all, I want to talk about participatory art and give you some ideas of how I think about that. And then I will talk about a program that applied some of that thinking in this part of the world. So one of the things that, that has shaped my working life, when I started working in community art or participatory art in 1980, 1981, and at the time, community art was a fairly disreputable thing to do. And lots of people in the art world in the 1970s and 1980s did not think it was a good way of working or that it produced good work. And so the strange thing is how this situation has become entirely transformed during the 40 years of my working life. This is an image from the opening ceremony of the London 2012 Olympic Games, which was directed by Danny Boyle and included about 3,000 performers and told a huge story about Britain, a very, actually quite a peculiar story, particularly if you're British. I'm not sure what the, the billions of people around the world made of this story. Most of it, I suspect, they didn't really understand. Um, because what you can see in this image is the story of the National Health Service. Who on earth would think you should put this into a community play for the rest of the world? I mean, it's bizarre. Um, anyway. The, for me, this is a, a, a symbol of how the mainstream art world has taken on and sometimes appropriated, questionably, sometimes uh, changed the practice that I was involved in uh, um, in its early years. And that's what I want to talk to you about, why this has become so important and crucially what it is. Um, but before I... I uh, talk about some of the issues, I want to explain what I mean by participatory art. And I use only two terms, participatory art to mean the whole broad spectrum and community art by which I mean the work that I specifically have been involved in and care about. And I'll say more about that uh, later in, in this talk. Um, there are lots of other words being used in the art world, socially engaged practice, relational aesthetics, um, uh, arts and development, and so on. I think they are interesting, but they are unhelpful, largely because they just make everything more complicated for people who don't work in the art world to understand. So if we want to work with people who don't work in the art world, we have to use a language that is reasonably understandable. So what is participatory art? Um, sorry. Here is the definition that I offered. I wrote a book about all of this in 2019 called The Restless Art. And in the information about this Academy can, there's a link that you can download the PDF of that book if you want to know more. I, for me, participatory art is the creation of art by professional and non-professional artists. So it's intentionally a very simple idea, very simple definition, um, but it already has two ideas that for some people in the art world are controversial. The first is that participatory art involves the creation of a work of art, by which I mean, I don't consider education work to be participatory art. Education work is really important. We all need to learn, but we, when we are learning, we are not involved in creating art. That's not the purpose of the activity. The purpose of the activity is to learn. And they're different things. The creation of an artwork, and this is a, an image from the Vermilion Mural Collective in South Dakota. Vermilion is a small town in South Dakota. The, um, and it's a celebration of uh, indigenous women's uh, culture, both the, the indigenous women of the area that is now called South Dakota, the, um, uh, the, the uh, indigenous American uh, peoples and more recent uh, 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 women of color uh, and to 
to paint this mural, which was done during lockdown in, in 2020, to paint this mural on the main street of quite a conservative uh, minded uh, community is an important statement of meaning. And that's what I, when I say a creation of art, we make art in order to create meaning, to say, this matters to me. This is how I see the world. This is important. This is what I believe. That is the distinctive thing that art making involves. And participatory art is about the creation of that work of art, of meaning. The second thing that I, that I think is important in, in the definition that I offered is the use of the term professional and non-professional artists. I think there is only one meaningful way of understanding what, who is an artist, and that is an artist is somebody who is making art. An artist is not somebody who went to college, it's not somebody who is paid, it's not somebody who is recognized by other people. It is in the act of making art that you become an artist in the same way that you're a cook when you cook, you're a runner when you run. It's entirely independent of whether you're any good at those things. Yeah, trust me, you don't want to eat my cooking. But when I cook, I'm a cook. I'm just a bad cook, right? So we have to decouple the idea that art, being an artist is being a special kind of person. An artist is a person who does a special kind of thing. Some people do it a lot, and they are called professional artists. They're recognized as professional artists. Other people do it once, occasionally, for this moment, and they are non-professional artists. In this image, which is from a project I'm working on, an opera project, it was taken last summer in a, a prison in Leiria in Portugal. The, the people in, in T-shirts at the back of the image that you can see are inmates of the prison. Um, the woman in, in red is a professional opera singer. They are making a performance together, but they are all artists in the moment that they are doing that. However, there is a difference between professional and non-professional artists because they bring different resources. This is an image from a project in France called Banlieue Bleu, a really good jazz festival, which has been doing excellent work in one of the toughest neighborhoods of the outskirts of Paris called Saint-Saint-Denis. And the image you can see, I love this photograph. I use it a lot because, uh, so I saw the, the, the final performance uh, in Clichy-sous-Bois one night performance with a whole range of young people from this neighborhood and some professional artists, including the guy in the cap who's about to fist bump the, the kid with the microphone. Um, he's called Napoleon Maddox. He's a rap artist and a musician from New York. Um, uh, the guy in the yellow t-shirt is from um, a, a improvised music jazz group from Rouen. But what I love about this is there's a, I don't know the name of the, the kid with the the microphone, unfortunately. He's a kid from Pichy sous bois um, These people don't speak the same language. Napoleon Maddox doesn't speak French. The kid doesn't speak English. They are just at the moment of deciding that they're going to trust each other. That's what I see in that fist bump. They're going to make something together. And they do so as professional and non-professional artists. So the professional artist brings an education skill and expertise, knowledge, brings experience of making art, a context, an understanding of who their peers are, and that enables them to bring an informed judgment to the practice of their work. And hopefully they also bring talent. What does the non-professional artist bring? They bring a range of things. Sorry, this is not moving. Okay. They bring most of all, perhaps, an open mind. They haven't been trained. And so they say, why are we doing it like this? Why don't you try this idea? And suddenly the professional artist who's been taught to work and think in a particular kind of way says, actually, you're right. Why don't I do it like this? They, they have new ideas. They also have knowledge. This, this performance that I saw was called Home. It was a performance that included a very wide range of, of people from Tichy sous bois including people with a migration background, um, uh, foreign workers and others. Uh, and uh, what 
the, uh, the young man with the microphone is bringing is knowledge of what it's like to be 14 and living in Tishi Subwa. Napoleon Maddox doesn't know anything about Tishi Subwa. He only arrived three days before. So there's a whole set of knowledge and experience that the, the, the uh, young man on the, uh, with the white, uh, the gray hoodie is bringing to, to, the, to, that, uh, to that work. He also has something to say. Non-professional artists become involved in these projects because they want to make meaning. Just like that image that I showed you of the indigenous women's culture in uh, Vermilion. They've got something to say and they've got a need to say it. It may be that they only want to be involved in this project once because the thing they need to say, they need to say now. When they've said it, when they've done that, that's fine. They'll get on. They don't have the intention to be an artist for the rest of their lives. And of course, they are just as able to bring talent as the professional artists. So this is an image from a performance that I saw in Rotterdam by a group called Fader Theatre. It's called Talent op de Flucht, in Dutch, Talent on the Run. Um, all the people you can see in this photograph are uh, asylum seekers, refugees from the Syrian civil war. They met in an asylum seekers center, um, about 15 people in the company. They met and uh, two of them had, were professional theater makers who had careers in the Syrian theater before the civil war. The rest had never performed before. Their, their play, their, their performance was about their stories as to why they had left uh, Syria and their journeys. But it wasn't simply oral history. This was theater. They made theater, they made art out of it. Um, but watching a performance about the making theater out of their own experience than watching a story about the Syrian civil war that would be performed by Dutch actors. Even if the Dutch actors had spoken to to uh, asylum seekers and refugees, because you you cannot separate the meaning of the artwork cannot be separated from the lived experience of the people who are creating the artwork and that makes it, I think, different. The other thing that is important to say about that difference, it is not a different quality. This is a performance that was filmed and shown on the BBC at Easter 2016. Uh, it's a performance of adapted from Bart St. Matthew Passion by uh, a, a vocal group called the 16, which is one of the most celebrated, admired uh, choral group in, in the world, and an organization called Streetwise Opera, which works with homeless people. So you can ask how, how is it possible for performers who have been singing Bach since they were five and have trained voices and all of the skill and judgment and experience of that to perform with people who uh, sing once a week in a workshop uh, and are most of the rest of their lives coping with all kinds of problems that come with the experience of homelessness. One of the, the, the solutions, one of the things that was really powerful about this, this work, the figure of Jesus that you can see in the middle of this image, surrounded by Pharisees, was played by eight different members of Streetwise Opera. And they had the scarf that the, the person is wearing, the brown and white striped scarf was handed from one performer to the next. So you knew who it symbolized, this is Jesus. So it didn't matter that Jesus at one point was a, a black woman, at another point was a white man. You understood this was Jesus. And actually the fragility of the voice of the non-professional artist brought something completely different to the experience of watching uh, the St. Matthew Passion. You suddenly saw, here is a victim who is going to be put to death by these powerful people around them. 
And suddenly then the powerful voices of the Pharisees suddenly become almost instruments of violence in the performance. Now I explain all of this just to say that you have to not judge, you have to bring different understanding of judgment. If you, if objectively, if you, if you compare the voice of a member of Streetwise Opera with a, a voice of a, one of the 16, it's not good, it's not technically proficient. But if you respond to it as an artwork, it becomes something very different and has a power all of its own. So why make participatory art? And I included this image from uh, Kaunas, uh, from some of the work that Ed and Vita have, have been involved in, who have also been making an opera uh, in their neighborhood, although they talk to you about something different tomorrow. There are three principal historic reasons why uh, people have sought to open up um, uh, uh, art to non-professionals. Uh, the first is cultural democratization. It's the policy that cultural uh, culture in European cultural policy has adopted since the end of the Second World War. These are images, again, from a, a project I'm involved in with the Liceo Theatre, the Opera House in Barcelona to involve, to open up opera to um, people who would not normally go. That is what is normally meant by cultural democratization, inviting people to access the, the, the cultural facilities and resources of our incredibly rich world. The second uh, intention, the second reason uh, is social change. This is a photograph from a company called Geese Theatre, which works exclusively in the criminal justice system. And as they say, this is a, a quote from their, their business plan. They say to use theatre to enable choice, personal responsibility and change. In other words, they're using theatre for a social purpose. If they found that sport was more effective than theatre, Maybe they should logically change to using sport to achieve their goal, because their goal is social change, not the production of theatre. As it happens, they're very good at theatre and it works very well for, for what they're doing. So that's the second uh, purpose. The third purpose, and this is again an image from a, from a, a project that I've been involved in, this is National Theatre Wales working for four years with the community in rural West Wales and the culmination of, of that uh, work. The third uh, definition, the third intention is cultural democracy. Cultural democracy emerged in the 1970s as a reaction, a part of the change from the 1960s, as a reaction to cultural democratization. The idea that cultural democratization could be very paternalistic, very condescending. It was simply about imagining that ordinary people who didn't come to opera or the gallery or the theater didn't have any cultural life. Therefore, they were kind of blank and you just needed to fill them up with, with the riches of the cultural world. Cultural democracy maintains that everyone has culture. Culture is diverse, complex. And the issue is precisely Article 27 of the uh, Declaration of Human Rights, the ability to participate in the cultural life of the community. Now, how do these things work together? Um, I, I think that they are not exclusive. They define a territory. So there is an overlap between cultural democratization, social change, and cultural democracy. And this field that I would call participatory art spans part of all of those things. The reason in my neat little diagram that participatory art is smaller than, than the rest is because you can do all of those things without using participatory art. You can pursue cultural democracy without doing participatory art. Same with cultural democratization. But the, they are... Um, uh, these three intentions define a territory. So it's not, it's not a, a one thing, it's a territory. And I've described it as a border territory of shifting intentions. And 
this is a um, another way of thinking about it, which is that within this territory, people move. It is not a fixed thing. So, uh, first of all, all of these projects involve more than one person, by definition. They at the very least involve one professional artist and one non-professional artist, otherwise not participatory art. And as soon as you have more than one person, you may have more than one intention. One, uh, the people may, may feel closer to cultural democracy or closer to social change, but it's okay because these ideas are not in opposition to each other. It's just that I, I can stand more over here in this, in this circle and you can stand more over there, but we can still work together. It's okay, we have enough territory in common. The other way in which this is a, a border territory of shifting intentions is that we change. We are not stable. And we particularly change while we're doing projects like this. So we may start off thinking, I, what I want to do is social change, but actually I'm learning, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from other people. And I'm now going towards cultural democracy because I have a different idea of what I'm trying to do. And again, all of that is legitimate. So I'm encouraging you to not take a, a rigid or fixed view of these intentions or these ideas that I'm outlining to you and not take a rigid or fixed view of your own intention. Your intention may stay broadly the same. I have been broadly trying to, to work in cultural democracy for 40 years, but I've done it in different ways and at different times and to different degrees at, throughout those 40 years, partly because I'm always responding to what other people are doing. And sometimes I need to compromise. I need, I can't go as far as I would like in a project, but I can still go some of the way and achieve some of the things I want to achieve. Okay, I'm coming to the end now. And I just want to talk you through the definition, my definition also from um, the, the Restless Art of, of what I describe as community art. And community art is a practice that is for me, it sits firmly in cultural democracy. Um, it starts, as you'll see, with the same elements as my definition of participatory art. So participatory art has to be this big thing. And that means the definition is very broad and open because everyone has to, to find a, a way to fit in there. Um, but community art, I think, is more demanding and more difficult. And it has another, a number of other elements. The first is the recognition that what I'm involved in is culture as a human right. That's the foundation. As I said at the very beginning of this morning, everything stands on that. And if that's true, if I accept that, then that means that I'm always in working on projects where people are cooperating as equals. Because if we're talking about human rights, if we all have the same human rights and the, the base, the, the idea of human rights is they are universal and you can't, uh, you can't lose your human rights. The difference between human rights and citizenship rights, and this often gets forgotten, which, so bear with me a moment. People talk about rights and responsibilities. Now, that's become the discourse of the last 30 years. Human rights come without responsibilities. Your only responsibility in terms of human rights is to be a human being. Citizenship rights come with responsibilities. If you want your rights as a citizen, you have to pay taxes, you have to obey the law, okay, that's a contract. That's a transactional relationship. But human rights, you cannot, there is no, there are no circumstances in which your human rights not to be tortured can be taken away and you can be legitimately legally tortured. Okay, so that's why we're cooperating as equals, because we are all fundamentally, we all have the same human right to participate in the cultural life of the community. We get a bit more technical now for purposes and to standards they set together. Very often, in, as, the, as participatory art has become normalized, um, political entities, 
municipalities, governments, uh, foundations, cultural institutions set up participatory art projects that they plan in advance. And so uh, a, a municipality may say, okay, we want, we want to give you a grant to do a participatory project with young people in order to get them back into education. On the surface, that seems fine, but I think that's not community art because the reasons, the purposes, and the standards don't involve the young people. The cultural organization that's been given a grant goes out and says, who wants to be in a theater project? And probably doesn't tell the young people that the reason they're there offering them a, uh, to, to be involved in a theater project is to get them back into education. So there is already um, a dishonesty. They're already not cooperating as equals because the young people don't have any opportunity to say, that's, I'm not interested in that because they don't even know that that's the agenda. So that's why for me, it's important that we're uh, cooperating as equals to purposes and to standards that we set together. And finally, because we set the purposes and standards together, the processes that we will use, the products that come out of it and the outcomes that we experience cannot be known in advance. I don't know what's gonna happen over the next three days because each of you is bringing your own ideas, your own preoccupations, your own concerns, your own interests to this discussion that we will have. I'm not trying to make, uh, to pretend that what we're involved in is community art, but we're involved in a process where I hope we will be cooperating as equals as much as possible. Of course, there are things that had to be planned in advance, but that's the, the intention. And it also becomes, as I said, cultural democracy. It is about respecting what everyone brings to that cultural engagement and process and uh, working together to create meaning. So when I said um, the most recent piece of, of uh, community art that I've done has been a creative writing workshop that led to the, to the creation of a, of a book by the, by the writers who took part, I didn't know we were going to make a book at the end of that. It was not part of, I wasn't asked to make a book. Um, it wasn't part of, of the, um, the, the planning. Uh, the only reason it became a book is because the quality of the work that people did and the amount of work they did, and also the cohesion of the work that they did because it was written during lockdown and it had that atmosphere. The book was called Wish You Were Here. That was the only thing I brought to the table. I brought that phrase, like the phrase you write on a postcard from the seaside. And that gave it a, a unity and it naturally became a book. And I think it's a really good book and that people are really proud of it. But I didn't know that in advance. Um, okay. Just to finish with this uh, image, which is, uh, from a group called Intelliki Arts that I've worked with over the years. You can't see it very well. Sorry, we should have turned the lights down. You haven't been seeing. I've been seeing beautiful images on my screen and you haven't been able to see the beautiful images. But uh, this is a group from South London. Um, and I love this image just because this is a group of people who uh, have been involved in some extraordinary work. Um, none of the people that you can see in this particular image are professional artists. There are professional artists involved in the group, but they're not in this image. But it really is, um, for me, a, a, a symbol that represents cultural democracy and the, the sense of what cultural participation can be for people. Um, that you come up with something, I mean, this is the equivalent of the drummer and the saxophonist and the triangle player making something that nobody would have expected beforehand. The project I'm gonna talk about the program um, is in many ways, I think the, the work I'm most proud of having been involved in and feel was most successful of anything that I've ever done. Um, but it, obviously it's particularly relevant because one of the countries that, that was involved was Romania. Um, so 
the Living Heritage Programme. Um, it operated from 2001 to 2005 in uh, those four countries. It was developed and financed by the King Baudouin Foundation, which is the Belgian, the, the principal uh, Belgian uh, charitable foundation financed by uh, the Belgian Lottery, among other resources. Its partners included uh, the Open Society Foundation, uh, the Carpathian Foundation, Romanian Environmental Partnership Foundation, and the EU in different countries. Over that period, uh, it, uh, the program budget was uh, 2.2 million euros. Uh, operated in four countries and 140 projects. 40, 39 of those projects were in Romania, mostly in Maramurish and um, Transylvania. Um, what was the program? It was essentially, we, we uh, created a strap line that described it as community development through cultural resources. In other words, if you like, it was firmly on the social change uh, side of, of uh, those intentions. But uh, picking up Ed's point, it was also very close to cultural democracy. It was using cultural means and producing cultural outputs. By outputs, I mean festivals, museums, publications, performances. But the outcomes, the change that resulted was human, social, and civil society. And that's what I'm going to talk you through. And crucially, I'm going to talk you through why I think this, what the approach we adopted was and why I think it was successful. Uh, because I think the approach and the factors of success are fundamentally transferable to all kind of community development work. And again, I should say the report that was published in 2005 that I wrote on this book, there's a link where you can download a copy of it uh, from on in the, the um, program for this academy camp. So all the details of it, you will find there. I came into the project originally because I was asked to do some research in uh, the UK, Ireland and Scandinavia by the King Baudouin Foundation as part of the preparation for the programme. The programme already had its name, Living Heritage, um, and uh, that was interesting to me because the King Baudouin Foundation um, uh, Belgium has several uh, official languages and English is not one of them. Um, but they had made a decision, they wanted to do something around heritage and they specifically chose that English language term because they thought it would have more neutrality in uh, post-communist societies. We, were, we started this work in 1998, so really very close to the, to the uh, end of the communist uh, governments of the countries we were, we were talking about. It took a long time to, to um, operationalize the idea, which is why it started in 2001. So an early problem that I had when I then became involved in the program as a trainer and ultimately as an evaluator. Uh, and an early problem that I had in talking with people. So the program started in Macedonia, today North Macedonia, and then in Bulgaria. And we had pilot projects, four pilot projects in Macedonia, four in Bulgaria. And people from the communities concerned, and you'll understand more about who they were in a minute, they would come to a three-day capacity building uh, um, program and they would say well what do you mean by heritage and I didn't have a good answer at that point so I would say well it could be arts crafts could be conservation could be local traditions it could be food culture could be the natural environment museums oral history 
and you know i was just confusing them with words really um, and confusing myself these images are some of the things that happened um, uh, on the far right the restoration of the clock tower in vranduk in uh, bosnia herzegovina um, a 1930s singing group from Bulgaria, um, a food festival, uh, I think from Romania, that image, and, a, and another oral history uh, project from Bulgaria. So that was an early problem. And I also learned a really early lesson. In the, the first capacity building, project in uh, first capacity building session in uh, Bulgaria. Uh, the photograph you can see, this is Ivanovo, um, a town in central Bulgaria. Uh, it was rebuilt in the 1960s, three kilometers away from the original site, uh, because it was rebuilt by the railway line. Uh, and that's the rebuilt Ivanovo that you can see. And we, uh, we're working with local partners in each country, so local foundations in Bulgaria, a foundation called Workshop for Civic Initiatives Foundation, and they'd identified Ivanovo as a place where we might do a project. And we invited the people to come and see us, come take part in the capacity building program. And four people came. I remember the mayor of Ivanovo and uh, three other um, notables, uh, important people from the, the town. Um, and they wanted to do a project about this, because Ivanovo uh, is, is a World Heritage Site, has rock-carved medieval churches with paintings. And I was listening to them, um, and it was really interesting. I was learning about I knew nothing. I, it was my first time even in Bulgaria, I, so I was just there listening. But uh, I asked them to tell me about Ivanovo. And they told me about the rock cut, rock cut churches. And I already had an, a worry, which was that they told me they were managed by the Ministry of Culture in Sofia. And I thought, okay, nobody's going to let you do anything here because it's a World Heritage Site and it's managed by the Ministry of Culture. But I was asking them about Ivanovo, what it was. And they were told me the story about the village being moved. And they told me that people still go back to the site of the old village where the ruins of the church are, and they have picnics. And they were, and what I saw was how excited they got when they started talking to me about the site of the old village. This is what they thought I wanted to hear about, but this is what I wanted to hear about. This is the site of Ivanovo, the abandoned site. Why did I want to hear about it? Because this is what they cared about. This is what they thought I cared about. What I cared about didn't matter. What mattered for this project was what they cared about, which was this. So what I suggested to them was, why don't you do a project about the old village? And this is some of what resulted. So this mural, in the cultural center. Um, this is the group of, of people. They produced a monthly newsletter, four page newsletter of photographs and stories about the old village. And this is in the, the library where they, they started gathering a local history collection of, of copies of all the things that, that they were doing. And, and they produced a map, this beautiful map. This is... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, this is the map of Ivanovo that's uh, in the town. But look, this is the, the beautiful old village with all of its photographs and stories and all these, you know, who lived in this house and who lived in this house. It uh, went on, it, it blossomed into a huge project. And eventually they did then do another project where because they had gained so much skill and confidence and energy from doing this. They did do a project about local craft traditions and produced a book about the rock craft churches and a little exhibition in the, in the House of Culture, um, all to uh, um, 
welcome visitors to the, so they did eventually do something about the rock carved churches, but their root was through their own culture and what mattered to them. So for me, that was the most important early lesson of this, this project. I've said there were 140 projects and we did eventually do something that ended up like that list of what, what is heritage. We did all kinds of things, oral and local history, museums, festivals, lots of environmental things, uh, folklore, traditional culture, and so on. You can see the list. Um, some of the, uh, in, ter in terms of what I'm gonna to talk to you about, uh, you, you'll get an impression there was more um, environmental work um, and more uh, conservation, partly because the photographs that I have tended to be when I was visiting the places and I wasn't always visiting the places when the festivals and things were happening. So that's slightly misleading. The other thing that you'll see in these photographs, I think two little historic things. One is you'll see photographs um, uh, that are 20 years old that show uh, Southeast Europe as it was, not as it is now. And the other thing you, you may see is quite a lot of not very good photographs because they would, this was happening just on the point when digital cameras were starting. And some of the pictures, when I looked back at them to prepare this presentation, I thought, okay, you're not really very good. But anyway, uh, here are some examples. This is uh, uh, a village called Smolari near the, the um, Greek border in Macedonia. This waterfall, 25 meter waterfall, was about uh, nearly a two kilometer, one and a half kilometer trek into the mountain behind the village. But it was a culturally very important place. There was a tradition. It's where you would go to ask uh, the person you love to marry you. Um, it was always where uh, young people went to be away from, because it was difficult to get to. Um, and the project became a project to make a path to the waterfall, including rock cut steps um, uh, like this. And finally, a bridge from which you could see the, the, the waterfall. It had an enormous transformative effect on the village, it became a tourist site. It was featured, the, suddenly the, the waterfall was in guidebooks. Um, it had never featured before. I'm not saying that's entirely a result of, the, of the, the thing. It's also about the time, the tourists starting to come to North Macedonia from Greece for the first time ever. Um, but it had a real economic impact on, on the village. But the most interesting thing for me, talking to the people who, who worked on it, it was a very divided village, politically divided village. And they worked all the way through uh, a winter. And I um, remember somebody telling me, it was fantastic. We didn't talk about politics during all the time we were working on the, on the, the steps and the bridges. We were just working. We were a community together. Uh, and so that sense of, of coming together was really important. Um, this is in uh, near Hagita in uh, uh, Transylvania. Uh, this is a project to uh, revalorize mineral water springs. There are several uh, um, uh, springs where people bathe, and uh, it was a big, ambitious project. And it included not only the things that you can see; these were all constructed, the pathways and the, the spaces around. Um, this is a, a, a toilet, it's a beautifully made toilet uh, in an environmental place, and um, a mineral water museum, um, which when I visited was still being, being built, and then this is what it finally uh, ended up as. Um, again, uh, a, a, a project that came entirely out of local um, assets, local situation, um, and interests. And now a different kind of project. This is uh, uh, Daju. Um, it was, I spent a morning visiting these people after they'd, they'd done the project. One of the things that I remember that really struck me, the project was, was 
coordinated by the municipality, the mayor, uh, the school and the church. And although does you, as you know, and particularly uh, 20 years ago, um, roads were very bad. So you didn't need to be remote to be quite difficult to get to. Um, and so this was a very, this was a community that was very turned in on itself, quite isolated in a sense. But the church, the, the town hall and the school had never worked together. And this was the first time they did. And they, they uh, did a range of things. They did photography project, they did a drama uh, festival and all kinds of things that were wonderful uh, to hear about. So that gives you a little snapshot of some of the things that we did, but obviously I can't give you 140 projects uh, now. I want to tell you something of the results. Uh, North Macedonia, the projects created temporary work or work for a year or two years for 165 people. Nine festivals, five museums were created. In Bulgaria, we calculated 3,200 volunteers took part in over 50 events attended by uh, nearly 9,000 people. 900 volunteers in, in Bosnia, 10 new cultural groups established, 30 events and festivals, four new community centers built. In Romania, 39 projects, seven new museums, cultural festivals, tourism, promotion, and environmental campaigns. So that when I talk about outputs, that's what I mean. These are outputs. These are things that were created by this. Some outcomes, human capabilities. I'm, I'm going through these things very quickly, but by human capabilities, and we'll talk more about this, what I mean is the skills, the, the capacities that we have to do things. Um, this was a, an extraordinary event in Bulgaria. They, they did a project about the genealogy of the village, and they traced everybody who'd ever lived in the village, and they made huge family trees that they pinned on trees and on boards and they invited everybody and 800 people came back to the village and they fed them all and that's what you can see in this image and this was a quote from one of the kids that I talked to we didn't have any free time in the summer holidays but we had a great time and they learned so much uh, doing this together Community development. This is, in some of you will know, in Bulgaria, there is a, a, a movement uh, of cultural institutions called Chitalishta that was begun in the 19th century. There are about 3,000 of them, local cultural institutions, typically libraries, but have grown into other things. This is one in a suburb of, um, uh, of Sofia that I visited. They had done a huge amount of things. And they were showing me, they showed me the mural, they showed me the children's artwork. This, when I took this picture, they were uh, uh, singing, some of the, the choir was, was singing to me. And the president of the Chitalishta, who was a, a, a man uh, in his 70s, was uh, taking me around and showing me everything. And at a certain point, he said to me, have we done enough? And I said to him, you've done far more than we could ever have expected that you had could have done with the, the, um, uh, with the funds that, that, that we gave you. And I'll come back to that. But the key thing is, when you trust people, what, what I learned, the lesson I learned from this, when you trust people by giving them some money and some support and showing that you believe in them, they really, really want to show that, they, that you were right to trust them. And that's, that's what I saw here. Um, and as I said, this quote from this project, the most important thing is that no one is issuing orders and no one wants anything in return. That sense of a community coming together to do things uh, cooperatively. And finally, uh, civil society, strengthening the structures of civil society. This is um, a, a project I'll talk about in a minute, Oresh in North Bulgaria. Uh, this is the, um, the House of Culture. And uh, this quote they gave to me at, at, at the end, the image, they said to me, the image of the Chitalish has risen to a higher level and the trust in us as persons and responsible people, builders of the town culture has increased. And I'll show you why that happened in a moment. 
why did this work as well as it did? Some of the success factors, capacity building. This is the budget for the five years of the program. The dark blue shows what we spent on capacity building. The, the lighter blue shows what we gave in grants. In other words, we spent between 30 and 40% of the project helping people to learn how to run projects. We, didn't, we then gave them money and that was equally important. But if we had given them the money without helping them to use the money, we would have disempowered them instead of empowered them because we would have set them up to fail in what they were trying to do. So there was a lot of field work and dialogue with communities, guidance, support and training, and an incremental approach to development. As you saw from the experience in Ivanovo, start with the local project, the oral history, things that you know about, and then go on to doing something that's more ambitious and more difficult. But the other key element was direct small grants. And this graph shows you the, the average size of grant in the five years of the project. What we learned, and it's great credit to the King Bodwan Foundation, they learned that they had started on the wrong foot. The first year of the project was not a success. The None of the first four projects in the pilot projects in Macedonia really worked because they were all given $50,000 and they couldn't spend $50,000. They didn't know how to. It immediately brought in a huge amount of, of disempowering constraints. And so you see by the end of it, the average grant was, uh, we changed the calculation to euros by then, but the average grant by the end was 5839 okay even allowing for inflation it's more today but in a in a in a context it was a lot of money and people were then able to leverage other money locally sometimes on the back of it why did it matter this is this is a, a town called avrig also in romania i visited uh, it was a project where women wanted to make a museum about their traditional um, textile culture. We gave the women the money directly. Nobody had ever given them any money before. They arranged for a curator from a museum in Sibiu to come and advise them. And he came uh, and he spent a day with them, and then he told them, wrote the report, and said, this is what you should do. And they paid him 200 euros and say, thank you very much, we're not going to do it. They could say we're not going to do it because they were paying him. It empowered them to say, if they weren't paying him, they would have felt obliged to say, oh, the big curator has come from the big museum in Sibiu and told us what to do, so we must respect his opinion. But they were able to, to feel, we know better how to display our culture than you do. And so thank you very much, we pay you a bill, but we're not going to follow your advice. The crucial thing about this, and this is a phrase I, I would often use talking to people about this, project. We were working with people who were the world experts in their own culture. I know nothing about the culture of Avrig, literally nothing. But I didn't need to. I know about how to make projects work and how to, to organize things. And those skills I could share with, with uh, the people I was working with. It was immensely empowering not to have somebody come in and tell people, what they should like, what they should do, what they should value. Going back to what I said in the first thing, how to make meaning through art and culture. Um, and this is another of the success values. We were working with people's assets and their capabilities. Because if people are the world experts in their own culture, they automatically have capability in how to do things in it. This is the view from the other side. This is the view from the Chitalishta of uh, Oresh. Um, and you can, this is what um, a typical 
Bulgarian small town, 10 kilometers from Ruse, but an hour's drive because the road was so bad. The problem that the people of Orish brought to us, and they, they also brought the solution, they said, in our town, the teenagers have nothing to do. They, they, they sit in the square and they're bored and then they frighten the old people. They don't mean to frighten them, but you know, the teenagers are, are sitting there looking at the old people and the old people are intimidated, but the teenagers are intimidated by the old people, right? What they decided to do was they said, we're going to, we want to do a project about the traditional Catholic dances of our town. Oresh is one of only about six Catholic villages in Bulgaria. And this is what they did. They uh, put together the young people with the grandparents, because the grandparents were the only people who knew the old dances, because they hadn't been able to perform the old dances during the communist period. So they had to, and suddenly the young people and the old people had something in common. And the grandparents loved that the young people wanted to know, and they loved that teaching them and that they were performing them again. This project became so big they had to create two dance groups because there were nearly 50 teenagers who wanted to, to take part in this. You can't really see it behind, but they managed to raise enough money to install a mirror on the wall in the, in the um, House of Culture uh, for them to perform. And this is some of the older people that, that they were working with. So the, the problem was a, a local problem and the solution was a local solution. Something I could never have, have anticipated. All I needed to do was to listen to what people were saying. So the last success factors and this is what we will work on in the, in the next three days, or this, this idea, is some principles. When I was asked to, to work on this, I'd never been to Southeast Europe. And so I, I, I was faced with this problem. What do I do? What can, how can I go and tell people who've just come out of uh, 50 years of communist government <laughs> in a culture that I know nothing about, what can I offer them? What I could offer them was some experience about what makes things work, and then uh, see how they could adapt them. And that experience was distilled into 10 principles. And I knew even at the time there were too many, but um, I couldn't at the time find a way to make it shorter. So these are the principles. The projects need to demonstrate there is a local benefit. They need to be sustainable in economic terms. We were going in with, on the one hand, a lot of money, several million euros, but across four countries, a very small amount of money. And crucially, we always knew we were only going to be there for a short time. There was no point in creating projects which would depend on grant aid to keep going. That meant that we had, they, the projects needed to support voluntary action. That also, they could only support voluntary action if they demonstrated local benefit. Why would people be vol volunteer on something that didn't have local benefit? Projects succeeded in they took an incremental approach. Again, back to Ivanovo, start, do one project that's not too difficult, succeed, you build confidence, you build skills, you can take on something that's a bit bigger. You need to be flexible and responsive. You're never in control of the situation you're working within. Therefore, if you start with the best plan in the world and you refuse to deviate from it because other people don't want to do what you want or doesn't, you know, or war breaks out, you know, you have to be flexible. This was a particular thing that I learned from talking to people in Sweden, talking to community heritage projects in Sweden. You have to get the media on side because the media will, most people will hear about your project through the media and their impression of what you're doing will either be positive or not positive according to what they read about. Today it's Facebook, 
But at the time, that wasn't an, an issue. But this, the thing of understanding that you have to tell your story well is critical. There needs to be good leadership and a clear vision. Your management needs to be accessible. Accessible by being like here. You're on the street. Your windows are open. People can come in and say, what are you doing? You have to work with openness and honesty. And finally, a, a phrase that came to me through a, a project in, in the UK, in a new town called Dig Where You Stand, an oral history project, but actually uh, comes from a, a, a very interesting Swedish uh, writer called Sven Lindqvist, who um, uh, was involved in, in coined this phrase in the 60s um, around uh, valuing local heritage. So those are the principles. What I was saying to people, and this is a connection with what I said to you before, these are tools for thinking, like my model of, of intentions. I'm not saying to you where you stand in this, and I'm not saying to you that the only projects that work will do these things. I am saying to you that projects that are in accordance with these project principles are more likely to succeed than projects which run against them. But in every case, I would, we'd said to people, what you need to do is to think through your projects against these principles. And you may have a good reason why it doesn't apply. You may not want to make friends with the media for some reason. Um, it, your project may not need voluntary input for some reason. But if that's true, then you need to be able to explain why. Not to me, but to yourselves within the project. You need to know why this is not true. Um, today, I would say the, the most important of these are these five. Local benefit, economically sustainable, valuing your volunteers, openness and honesty, and dig where you stand. The others are, are kind of subsidiary. And uh, if I tried again, I, I, would, I would like to get these principles down to five. I might have to rewrite them a bit. One of the problems with there being too many is I believe very strongly that we can only operationalize things we can remember. In other words, you can't act on things you can't remember. If you need to go to a bit of paper, to, then you've already lost the battle. It has to be in your head for it to be meaningful. Um, last thing, going back to my original question, my original problem, how did I define heritage? After a couple of years of working on this project, when people ask me, what do you mean by heritage? I simply said, heritage is whatever people care about. Why? Because it's the fact that they care about them that motivates them. All of these projects succeeded because people cared about what they were doing. I didn't have, ever have to persuade anybody to work on one of these projects. And none of the project leaders, none of the project teams had to persuade their local community to work on it. They understood the value, they cared about it, and therefore they were willing to get involved in all kinds of ways. And one of the things that you'll have seen, you may not have noticed it, but you'll have seen it in every picture of project teams that I've shown you is the diversity of ages and people and backgrounds of the people. Each of these project teams is like a cross section of the community that was concerned. So to finish, what we're going to do over the next th three days is to talk about some of the principles and some of the lessons that come out of this work from the Living Heritage Project. The last thing I, would, I want to say is most of these projects were working in conditions even more difficult than some of the conditions that you are working in, because we're talking about 20 years ago, we're talking about worse infrastructure, less funding, less capability. And because I'm still in touch with some of the people who are involved, I know that today, 20 years later, many of those projects are still operational. In other words, what we 
helped them do was build the capacity and the resources and the skills and the infrastructure and the organizational capacity around something that mattered to their community that they have been able to continue and sustain. And that's why I say for me, it's the most important thing I've ever been involved in. Ed Carroll and Vita Galunine. Hello. We're both community artists from a community in Conus in Lithuania. Originally, I'm from Ireland. Vita, originally from Conus. In this photograph or this image of the map, you can see this little section of our community. You'll see a lovely little river memo, it's called in German. This is a German map uh, made during German occupation. It's a community that's completely surrounded by a river. And today we're going to speak a little bit about that place. It's not a big community. You can drive from one end of it to the other, just four kilometers, and 20,000 people live there. So in terms of size, it's relatively small. It's the smallest administrative unit in Lithuania. <laughs> in terms of governmental, all cities are broken up into smaller administrative districts. So ours, I, I believe, is the smallest in Lithuania. And we are going to speak about our association, which is a community association. I think also many people have this legal format. We have 52 members and every year people pay a small fee of 12 euros to be a member. So you can fall off being a member and new people can join and so on. And this neighborhood uh, has about 20,000 inhabitants. Uh, we live in that neighborhood somewhere around this place. And when we talk about four and a half kilometers is that main street, the artery of the neighborhood. It's divided between lower neighborhood, lower Shanxi and upper Shanxi. And uh, the feature of the neighborhood is that it was built in the end of the 19th century. So the urban structure is formed in the end of 19th century when Lithuania was a part of the Russian empire until independence between the first and the second war. And then this place was filled with industry. So a lot of uh, workers, of factory workers, came into that neighborhood early in the 20th century. And this is when my great-grandfather moved into that place, built a house in which we are living now today. And, you know, if we speak about our, the context of our vision, let's say, for our neighborhood, obviously, like, we, we, we don't operate on every level. So we, we are operating in a very specific level, mainly because we feel it's a pulse in today's context. And that pulse we feel is how can the urban development of the neighborhood happen? How can it happen in a way that people are actively involved in designing it and co-creating it and being part of it? And of course, you know, the structures, the formal bureaucratic structures for people participating in the urban development of a neighborhood just don't exist. We have very formal structures, public meetings and things like that. But actually there is no place for ordinary people there's only a place at the table for the expert. And we are the believers that urban environment makes a direct impact on the character of the neighborhood, on the character of the community. So wh whatever changes are happening in the urban environment, they are directly attacking each of the inhabitants of the community, even though these people may be invisible, may live in their closed houses, never, go out of their court yet, still, if you come and ask every little impact that comes with urban development does have a direct impact to individual in that place. The photographs, all the photographs that we use in this slideshow are from, uh, from the activities in our neighborhood. And this particular one is an annual uh, cultural event, which happens usually in September. Uh, it changes its locations, but that one was at the bank of the river. And that's the main character of our neighborhood that we have still, a beautiful riverbank that did not experience the urban invasion. But uh, our actions start from this, that there is a big danger for this landscape to be changed and develop, to be developed. And so when we look at the, let's say the goals of what, our, what we try to um, move towards, 
like what are the thematics that we're interested in? I think the, the first thematic is, is the idea that self-governance has to become a new process where people are actively involved in its development. That we have to, you know, of course, you know, there are ways, let's say in the presentation we had yesterday on community budgeting, municipalities have their ways of doing these things, but communities also have to have processes by which they develop their capacity to be actively involved in self-governing. Whether you call it commoning or wh whatever processes you want to say, it, it's just somehow the capacity of communities to be self-governing has to in increase. Um, and that means being involved in decision-making. You know, it means being involved at the table, not when the project is already launched in an open call, but being there before the project was even developed as an open call. This is where, um, where, where, where we, 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 we try to, to really make a, a, an impact. Um, There's a question there. I, I, I can't take questions because your voice won't be heard on the Zoom. So I, I would just like to keep going and then we'll have questions when we have a microphone at the end. Okay. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that environment has become such a big issue for us as well, because invariably when new urban development happens, so we've experienced, like they'll cut 500 trees or they'll, you know, redo the river so that the, the, the quality of the water is, is not what it used to be. And there's, or, or they'll break down new trees in the Oak Park, which is a thousand years old. So in some ways, environment has become a, a, a very strong issue in, in, in these times as well. And I think, you know, if you, if you wanted to visualize what we're talking about, so you think of a neighborhood with little two-story wooden worker houses, with an infrastructure that was from the Tsarist period of a military base. And then suddenly, out of the blue, a, a municipality comes along and decides this is allowable. You know, three stories, three blocks, 24 stories. And this has been built today. And, you know, again, it's this sense in which urban development often comes in this aggressive way. We're the closest neighborhood to the city. So there is this extractive exploitation where it's seen as a really useful place even though historically it was poorer it was riskier it was so on, as as you have in, in in this city here but now it's seen as a place where we can extract our value from it our economic value and it's always outsiders who want to extract the value so this this is an, an example of of something that comes in from the outside that actually local people don't support and this is the problem. And uh, the values that the developers come in, you may ask yourself, what are they? Uh, do they come to uh, do something that is bad for the community? Do they have this uh, intention to really make something that the city wouldn't benefit from? So, there we have then uh, the two interests that we have to really address because the developers' narratives are usually that we come to make the community better. We come to make your neighbor, neighborhood flourish. And uh, the perception within the community is a completely different narrative. We think that it will decrease the quality of our lives. And so how we address these challenges. Uh, one specific problem that we uh, ended up uh, solving for now many years is a campaign uh, named the Namunas River uh, Road. So uh, again, there's an, a plan to build a car road by the river and thus to destroy the undeveloped uh, natural landscape of the riverbank. So uh, we started up with protests and in these pictures you see a community gathering, mobilizing, uh, getting out to, uh, rate to, to speak out and to be heard. So the protest form is the form that we employ, where we employ different art forms. Uh, visual, sound, performant, performative uh, art forms, which are uh, made in ad hoc way, but also uh, having in mind that every year we have cultural event, uh, we have uh, a lot of practice in cultural field, in other uh, 
uh, occasion, on other occasions, there is a certain level of capaci capacities within the community already to mobilize ad hoc and create something that is visually uh, attractive and that brings in the attention of media immediately. So uh, the question of the media that, was, that is one of the principles in Francois' principles list is uh, not a separate uh, to, to the uh, visuality of our expression. Uh, the visuality uh, it attracts media by itself. And we employ the river both as we employ the land for our actions. So how do we uh, address our challenges? Uh, we employ culture and art to strengthen identity of the community. Everything we do brings people together in a, and people act together uh, doing something interesting, doing something exciting, uh, making art. Uh, and uh, that part is really uh, something that glue us together people from very different backgrounds come together and they enjoy doing something most often in the, uh, in the moments of crisis. So really culture and art help to solve uh, the tension of the crisis. We run educational activities and community capacity building trainings. That's our responsibility as community to constantly nourish our, our community members and bring up our capacities. We create a virtual community platform and physical spaces that encourage public participation in civic actions. And there it is important to remind that we as a community have no shelter. We have no offices, no premises. We operate usually in public spaces, um, sometimes in libraries, sometimes in uh, the open spaces. Uh, so creating the place for us to act is always already an act of artistic expression that attracts people to come together. And uh, last year we started a virtual platform, which is a platform, uh, a website of our community. We develop partnerships and networks, and we implement a project to create urban vision of the neighborhood. So that's. Uh, a recent e event, the, the recent projects that we started in 2020, it's still uh, continuing on, and we will talk about it in the slides. The only partnership we don't have, and dialogue we don't have, is with the municipality. <laughs> so interesting. And so, you know, let's say if we look at weaknesses of, of our context, because I think it's always important for we we're not promoting something here so we're not trying to sell a project to you we're not trying to sell some something that we think is great we're just giving a, a reflection of our context maybe it's useful for you maybe not but the weaknesses that we see in our context is really civic participation you know we said it yesterday i've lived in this place for 50 years but i don't care about anything in that public space so we know the, the we we have the we share these 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 contrasting uh, contradictory things. Uh, we have a very particular issue, I think, in Lithuania, in, in the uh, Konus context, that we have a very um, corroded municipal, municipality. Um, and we really have a problem with rule of law. And in, in terms of rule of law, I think it's particularly around the area of private interest versus public interest. Very often, the thing that dominates in terms of municipal decisions is private interest. So business interest, gets a higher priority, uh, community interest is never uh, articulated and it's never listened to and it's never heard. And there's no structures for that. So rule of law. Obviously then the transparency of decision-making is, is a very big issue. In this project that we're speaking about today, the Anonymous Road Project, we had a plan launched in April, 2019, uh, costing about 50,000 euros, a major new development of a road along our riverfront uh, the community, you know, engaged in the process of public uh, uh, consultation. It took court cases against that road project. And then suddenly we heard very nine months later that the project was suspended because there was some legal problems with the way it had been processed. Uh, some months later, in April 2020, a new plan is launched. 
Uh, again, with big fanfare, this time it costs 80,000 euros, uh, give or take. Again, it's going to be the best plan ever. The road is shortened. Again, the community resists. We have the public consultations. We take court cases. And again, suddenly the plan is suspended because there was some legal problems with the plan. This is not our, our process, but this is the municipal process. So transparency and then obviously education, because, you know, if you want people to to participate in planning in urban design, how, how do you build capacities for people to do that? Okay, so uh, we measured civic participation in 2020 in October, just for uh, your information, it, we questioned 110 uh, people from the neighborhood uh, on Facebook. So it's a very targeted small audience who already are active somehow. And we got 15% not active and 6% very active. So we'll measure it again to see in two years time. You spoke about this so we can go on and uh, yeah, I think that's I just, think again, the photographs just given for different moments where we have a, a gathering. This, this photograph is very symbolic because it's where, you know, uh, one day as a resistance to the road project, a group of people came along this, what is a walkway, and held hands because in Lithuania in 1989, when the change of the of, of the return to independence came, it happened through a singing revolution where people just joined hands from Tallinn to Riga to Vilnius. So it was symbolic of that as a community saying, we don't want this. But the question I suppose all the time is, how do our weaknesses become our strengths? And then how do you turn protesting into vision? Because protesting is always a resistance. But how do, you, how do you develop something that's more proactive? So in 2020, we got a fund from an active citizen fund, which is funded by a European Economic Area and Norwegian funds. Uh, and it's purely dedicated to um, active, active citizenship. citizenship. Uh, the project is called Genius, Matsi Urbanization and Civil Community. In 2019, our neighborhood got an award from the Ministry of Environment, which was called Genius Lotsi for protecting the spirit of our neighborhood. And thus we decided that the project title will include this phrase. And it says that we are interested in civil community and urbanization. And we have three partners in it, uh, two from Norway and one uh, from Kaunas which is the University of Technology. Bodo City Municipality and Norwegian's uh, Association, Novi, the, the Association of Communities in Norway. Uh, so uh, it is very important for us that uh, within the pandemic uh, times, we develop digital tools and thus make all our activities possible uh, through, uh, through these tools. The timeline is that uh, the we, we aim to create three layers of digital interactive maps where the everyone uh, is free to upload the information about our neighborhood. And in the last year, we created a memory map, a present map, and for the future, we are going to do the future map. So maybe we can show this map in there. And uh, just to tell you about the activities that we've done in the last year, it's really something that you can see the, sco the, the, the scope uh, of, of actions of how many people we involved into these actions and what are the outcomes uh, of these actions. And uh, yeah, we will show you now how these three digital maps work online and uh, what kind of tool is that? And what are the um, results that we already can talk about? So the first map that we developed last year uh, was the memory map. Uh, the memory map has its own uh, uh, periods. And by clicking on these dots, we can come uh, and see just one period of history. So people, anyone is free to uh, 
top the create map button and uh, the form will open there. We click on this space that we want to mark on the map. The dot comes down, then the template comes down. We fill the template. The template goes to the administrators. Administrators admit, and we get the dot on the map that can be viewed and opened, and uh, the story can be read. We can go for more information and uh, we can upload up to four photographs. We can upload uh, links to the media, to other websites and so on and so on. Uh, at the bottom of this page, we have a gallery. And again, we can click through the gallery and see all the inputs uh, on the map just represented with a visual photograph. You know, one of the important things about the mapping process of memories is a little bit, as Francois was saying yesterday, that cultural heritage is what you care about. It's what you, it's not just the registered things. And we were really sort of working on this sort of Faro principle, Faro convention principle, that cultural heritage is what a group decides it's its cultural heritage. So it can be your story, your house, your family, your place, your, so, and this is what we were trying to get at, this untold cultural history, particularly because when formerly the municipality looked at our neighborhood, it saw old, broken down wooden houses, destroyed buildings, it, everything needed to be cleaned up. And we were saying, look, there is a cultural heritage, there's a cultural identity, there's a sense of belonging here uh, in this area that is unique. And your urban development plans really don't acknowledge this. So this is the is the is the rationale. Mm -hmm. The second map we developed is dedicated to the present day, and that's the present map. It works uh, on the same principles as the memory map, but its interest lies in the uh, uh, public spaces that are used today by inhabitants and visitors of the neighborhood. And the third map is dedicated uh, to the nature. So in this map, we mark uh, all the important places that we think are, uh, you know, have some interesting uh, uh, species or plants, you know, and so everything that people value in this neighborhood uh, can be marked on that map. Every map has a gallery. And again, you can quickly just flick through it, see what inputs are made by people and read more by clicking on each of the photographs, get the information, get the links, get uh, follow up more about one or the other object. So, um, Alongside with the three maps, we actually developed the whole uh, new website. And uh, we can also just give you a quick uh, idea of how to use that map and to find more uh, information about our activities, uh, which we kind of frame in six uh, big categories. And uh, you can see uh, this is the news active citizenship, opera, cultural events in Chines, Cabbage Field and Namunas uh, River campaign. And uh, just very brief uh, connection with our dear friend Francois happened through this particular project, uh, Opera, uh, which started in 2018 and it's still an uh, ongoing process of uh, of creation and uh, of uh, articulating uh, what uh, uh, what are our interests in art uh, and community development. So if I would answer the question that Francois gave to us yesterday before the end of the sessions, I can honestly say that the <laughs> most of the time of the work that I 
do uh, in my life is not that exciting. It's not that fun, uh, but it's all directed to achieve some fun moments. So I think the fun and the and the glory is only the the little peak, little moment in our lives that we uh, aim for. But the whole process is a cultivating process. We cultivate the land in order to grow a seed in that land, and that seed brings a flower, which, with autumn time, goes to to the same stage where we have to cultivate it again. So that's that's what we do. We cultivate uh, our lives in this particular neighborhood. I'm James and I work for Irish National Opera. I run their outreach programme um, and our studio programme, which is an early career programme for emerging opera singers. Irish National Opera is a relatively young company. We're in our fifth year. Um, a lot of people think, judging by the name, that we're an organisation that have been around for quite a long time. But we're a very, very small organisation. We don't have our own opera house. We're a sort of touring theatre company, go to various different places around the country. But we, we're growing pretty rapidly um, at present. And it's a really exciting and interesting and dynamic um, company to work for. But I'm here to talk to you today about our project Out of the Ordinary, or Asan Gnach, as, uh, to give it its Irish title. And I'll talk a little bit about that further down the line. This is a project that is part of Traction, uh, which is a European project as part of Horizon 2020. That's the logo there for Traction. And as you can see there, we the uh, mantra of Traction is Opera Co-Creation for a Social Transformation. So effectively, we are a consortium of organisations who are looking at how opera can be used in a positive way in society, in the creation of opera and community opera specifically, and also looking at how new technology can be used and incorporated into that process. So as a result, there are technologists who are involved in this, uh, this project, and there are also a variety of different arts producers. There's three community opera projects that are taking place across Europe um, and have been doing so since January of 2020, all producing very different kinds of community operas, uh, one of which is in Barcelona with the Liceo, another one in Portugal with SAMP, which is a, a community music organisation. Um, I'm not going to talk about those two um, today, uh, but if you head across to Traction's uh, website, um, uh, you can find details online um, for that. Um, uh, there you'll be able to read up on, on those on those projects and I'm sure Francois will be happy to fill you in um, on details of those. Um, but I want to talk to you today about Irish National Opera's um, project as part of um, out, uh, as, as part of Attraction uh, and that's called Out of the Ordinary which is a virtual reality community opera. We think that this is the world's first ever virtual reality community opera um, it's always very difficult when you say make a claim like that because it needs to be exhaustive, really. Um, uh, we don't know 100% for certain, but we've been talking about this pretty publicly for the last um, two and a bit years, and nobody has corrected us to date, so we're, we're pretty certain. Um, and as well, it is a particularly um, sort of niche combination. There have been uh, obviously plenty of community operas in the past, and there have also been a number of virtual reality operas, but never the two combined. So just to unpack what those two things um, uh, mean. Um, the virtual reality side of things, um, that is a opera that you experience in a virtual reality headset. As you can see, one of our participants there, Josh, in the photo, he's, he's wearing um, a photo there. Um, the, the glowing ball is, doesn't come with it. That's uh, just a, uh, a little bit of Photoshop. Um, they're effectively, uh, I don't know if many of you have worn virtual reality headsets, but they're effectively, um, handheld computers that you can uh, strap to your face basically and the interesting thing about them is they're incredibly immersive mm -hmm. um so if you are in mm -hmm. a virtual reality headset um there is a broader world that's created using 360 video or virtual design um, and you can move your head around um i think that is interesting in terms of the narrative capabilities um, that are on offer much in the same way that with the birth of cinema new stories could be told in cinema um, with the birth of video games, new stories could be told with video games. With every artistic medium, there are interesting dynamics at play that don't necessarily work in other mediums and are unique to that one. And I think virtual reality, 
we're at the real infancy of this art form. But I think in the uh, in the years to come, this is something that is going to be a lot more present. Um, and um, because there are new mechanics um, that people can use in storytelling. Um, I think a fund fundamental one for me is, is that um, when you look, certainly in the world of cinema, there are very few first person uh, perspective um, cinematic films uh, because that would be quite a kind of disorienting experience. That kind of work you can absolutely do in virtual reality. You can step inside the shoes of somebody in a way that you can't really in any other medium. Um, and I think that's very compelling. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the functionality of virtual reality a little bit later though. Um, the other thing to say about it is when we're talking about virtual reality in the sense of what we're producing, this is something that we've not, we're not filming in advance. We're, we're not looking to effectively create what is a theatrical film of, a, of an opera and then put it in a virtual reality headset. This is something, a new world that we would create digitally as you would with an animated film or a, or a video game or something like that. This is a, a world that's realized in that space, which is really exciting too, because the limitations really are your imagination, um, uh, which I think is quite freeing in, in the context of a community opera. Um, what we mean by a community opera is effectively a work that is produced in partnership with professional artists and non-professional artists. This is something that's important to the whole of Traction. Um, the idea um, that uh, people bringing uh, their perspectives and their experiences and their thoughts and their, their own skills into a space, even if they're not professional artists and don't have that particular background, they're able to offer things that people within our artistic community can't. Um, so we like to do work with community opera, Irish national opera, not because uh, we're wanting funding, although we always do like funding. So if you do know of any funding, let me know. <laughs> um, but um, we're, we're wanting to um, work with communities um, because actually artistically, it's very interesting to engage with people outside of our usual remit. Um, I, I'd say Francois will talk to you a little bit more about that relationship with, with professionals and non-professionals um, at some point to join, join your time with him. Um, the other thing to say at this point as well, as you can see there at the, um, the, the bottom, the various logos um, on this poster, we've also received a, an award for this, this project through the Fedora Digital Prize, um, uh, which was um, uh, yeah, we received last year for, for the project, uh, which is really exciting. It's giving a kind of a, a, a profile for the work. And I think it was also an indication that virtual reality is something that I think the... Um, the opera sector as a whole, because Fedora is an international uh, prize for, for opera and ballet houses. Um, the, the, the opera sector as a whole are, are interested in the world of virtual reality. And I think the, the arts is, will be looking to this, this kind of medium um, a little bit more. Um, so leading the team as part of this project are three professional artists um, here from left to right. I think it's left to right for, for you guys as well. Um, the, the woman on the on, on one side with the red hair there, that's Jo Mangan. She is the director um, of the opera. Um, then in the middle, that's Fanola Merivale. She's our composer. And on the right, that's Jodie O'Neill, who's the librettist or the um, uh, person responsible for writing the text. Um, so all three of them are leading on those sorts of things, but they don't quite have the same autonomy as they would in a typical um, opera because they're working with the ideas um, and the input from the members of the various communities that we've been working with as part of this project. So the communities we've been working with are very, very dispersed as part of this project. And that is intentional given the, the medium of virtual reality. Another reason why we're interested in virtual reality is its mobility. Um, one, one big problem in Ireland um, for our usual stage productions is we are limited um, as to where exactly in the country we can go to. Um, in the, your, in, I, I think in many countries there is this, this issue of capital cities being centralised as an area where most of the cultural activity takes place. Um, I'm from the UK, I know that was certainly the case in, in, in London um, and definitely is the case in Dublin as well. Um, uh, in Ireland here, um, that that is is also the case um in terms of there are good chunks of the country certainly um 
uh, in the Midlands of Ireland. So uh, I'm talking these capitals, like I don't know if you're able to read this, but places like Longford and Westmeath and Offaly, um, where there isn't the um, theatrical space for us to put on a, a traditional um, production. Um, what's great about the virtual reality is you can just bring along a headset, maybe a few extra bits, um, and you can tour that really to anywhere you'd like. So it's it's very egalitarian in terms of where it, where it goes. So as a result, when we first set out to do this project, we wanted to do something with people from across the country and try and see if we could create something with people who weren't sort of confined to one particular locality, but were in various places and get a sense of the diversity of Ireland and the, the, the variety of opinions. So there are two locations that we did focus on because there is practical elements in terms of making sure there are these focuses. Um, one being the island of Inish Mion, um, there on the left. You can see just off the coast of Clare there, there are three small islands. They're known as the Aran Islands. Uh, the middle one of those is Inish Mion um, or Inish Man. Um, uh, it's a very, very small island. It has a population of around 170 people, um, although that goes down uh, during the winter time. Um, there's uh, just really one shop there and one one pub or cafe um not a lot else really on the island um very rural very beautiful though um and it's in an area known as the Gwaeltocht uh, which is an area of Ireland where Irish um the Irish language is the first um uh, language for most people in that area um that really largely um, takes place uh, across the west coast of, of Ireland, the, the Grail Tocht area, whereas on the east, that's not so much the case. Um, the uh, second group there, um, adults who are living in Tala. Um, Tala, as you can see, is very close to Dublin. It's a, it's just a sort of um, uh, uh, residential area, not far from the Dublin city centre, very urban, very diverse um, uh, community, lots of interesting uh, cultural work happening in that place, very, very different to Inish Mion. And then we also collaborated with secondary school students, which initially this began working with students in the areas of Westmead and Offaly, but actually we then expanded out and we've been working with secondary school students from various places um, around the country, largely in areas that are pretty rural. Um, so you can see there are people from across the country working this of all ages and backgrounds and experiences, which has been really interesting, but has also had its challenges. Um, here is a picture of uh, some of the people who've been involved. Um, uh, on the left, you can see th these are some of the people on the island of Inish Mion. Um, we've been out there a few times and worked with them. Uh, and then on the right hand side, um, that's a combination of the people from Tala and also the secondary school students. Uh, we, we brought them all to Dublin for a few days or a few a series of, of, of weekend uh, workshops. Um, yeah. So going back to um, this project and how it first began, uh, we started, as I said, in, in January of 2020. Um, we put together a, a bid for the Horizon funding in 2019, and we found, found out we were successful towards the end of 2019 uh, with a view to begin work in, in uh, 2020. Um, so as you can imagine, and I'm sure you've all been through this in, in your various forms of the, the works you, you've been doing, um, we began to build for uh, a community opera for a world that was rapidly changing. Um, and in March, when the COVID-19 pandemic struck in Ireland, um, uh, things uh, certainly were planned for at that time. Um, uh, I don't know what it was like um, in Timisoara at the time, but certainly here in Ireland, it was very difficult for us to get a sense of how long the, um, uh, how long this, pandemic was was going to last for um, to begin with the government were talking about weeks and then that turned into months and as we know it's it's essentially turned into years now um, so as a result um, a lot of the work we were doing was postponing things or um, reimagining things to happen at a slightly later time um, uh, but what was really important to us at that point was making sure that we did some activity in person and met people in person uh, but we realized after um, uh, after a while, that actually wasn't going to be possible, and we needed to start work with these people in some form. So um, uh, we began in January 2021 um, running a series of workshops um, uh, online, um, which happened uh, all the way through to um, uh, to the summer. Um, these were 
uh, focused workshops in the sense that they focused in on one particular discipline. So you can see here's a screenshot from uh, one of our writing workshops. And this was a, a workshop that just was with the people of Inishman. Um, there are, uh, we, to begin with, we kept these workshops in isolation for the various community groups. Um, uh, we wanted to slowly introduce people into the project. I think one challenge when working with non-professionals as well um, is making, uh, giving them the license to feel like they have a voice in this. Um, I think it can be a very intimidating experience if you're coming and working with a professional artist. Um, and uh, for me as a producer, it's very easy for me to say, oh, your, your voice is equal in this, this partnership, but th those are just words. And you need to make sure people feel that way. Um, and I, I think asking someone outright, what would you like this new virtual reality community opera to be about as a, as a sort of opening question it's quite an intimidating one for someone, particularly if they're working with a professional writer. Um, I think it takes time for people to feel like they have that creative license and to feel like they are creative. Um, so as a result, we set absolutely no agenda um, for these first uh, workshops. Um, it was about just getting people to feel creative and think creatively in various ways um, and, and realize that they had creative license um, to, and, and, and that their voice was worthwhile as part of this project. Um, so we ran writing workshops to begin with, with various groups. Um, hi, Francois, is everything running smooth? Is it? Oh, no, it's fine, no problem. <laughs> you just appeared and I wasn't sure. Um, so we ran, began with writing workshops, um, uh, and then we moved on uh, to visual arts workshops, a uh, variety of different kind of visual arts, um, some to do with photography, with collage work, with map drawing. Um, and then we moved on to composition. Um, I'll talk about those um, a little bit later. Um, uh, and a, a huge amount of work was created across all those workshops. I think there was around 50 to 60 different kind of workshops that took place as, as online during that period. And still at this point, we hadn't really met anybody in person as part of the workshops. Um, here is an example of some of the visual art, as I said, that took place, as I said, a variety of different kinds of styles. This is just a small sample of some of the work um, uh, that was, was produced um, to give you an idea of, of what, what it was that we had. Um, with, with regards to the composition and musical aspect of, of things, our composer, Fenola Merivale, led those sessions. Um, we used as part of this a, a new tool that was been had been developed as part of Traction. Um, Traction had been developing a whole tool set of of, um, of uh, uh, pieces of technology um, that artists and producers can use um, in community opera and and the co-creation space, or it's, it's called the Media Vault. Actually, in this screenshot, um, is is one of those um, examples. Um, uh, it was a, effectively a, a, an enclosed social media platform um, uh, for people to share their creations and ideas that Fanola had asked them to produce um, in an enclosed space, a safe space with just people who were involved in the project. And it was a way for people to kind of comment on one, of, on one another's work. Um, it worked really well. I mean, you can just see here, this is a video that um, one of the participants put up um, and you can see um, people have, have kind of liked it with emojis and all those sorts of things, which I think, again, reinforces this idea of giving people sort of create, creative license. The kind of material that we, um, that Fanola briefed the participants to produce was quite varied. It was, again, about getting people to think differently about music and make, thinking about being creative about music and not necessarily having to have, uh, you know, a grade eight on the piano or be really, really skilled at, um, at playing music, uh, musical instrument. Um, so there were exercises such as trying to make uh, a composition using just your body, but without singing. You know, what kind of sounds can you produce with your body without singing? Um, another one was about creating compositions. And this is this was one of them with uh, an object in your house that isn't a musical instrument. Um, so Cara, one of our participants here, made a whole video um, creating a piece of work based around her makeup. Um, we also did work around um, uh, making music electronically. So what free software can you download on your laptop on a sort of regular uh, laptop that doesn't have any particularly, isn't particularly high powered in any kind of way? Uh, and what kind of interesting sounds can you produce that way? Um, uh, I think this, that, this, this series of these, these workshops not only um, uh, 
generated a huge amount of material for the artist to begin thinking about what this opera would look like. Um, uh, but it also was an opportunity really for the um, uh, the non-professional artists to to get to know the professional artists and trust them and, and know that this is a um, uh, this is a happy medium uh, this is a happy space to kind of work in um, and I think that has been to our benefit in the project further down the line um, eventually um, as the world opened up we were able to finally meet in person um, so we're looking at sort of late August September of last year um, we met uh, a few times with the secondary school students and with the uh, people of Tala uh, in Dublin, uh, a variety of different um, activities taking place um, during, um, during this period. You'll have noticed actually that, that in that first series of workshops I talked about, there was no uh, mention of virtual reality. I mean, we said it was for a virtual reality opera, but we weren't getting people to think about virtual reality in that in that sense just yet. But we started to introduce that here. Um, so uh, that's Camille in the in the bottom left there, which is one of our um, facilitators uh, and an expert in VR, um, showed the participants what VR can look like in different um, different artistic opportunities in there and got people used to those. We also brought professional instrumentalists along. The final work will be written for a, a small professional ensemble alongside non-professional performers. And so they met them and the, 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 the musicians showed them what their instruments can do and the capabilities. Um, we had improvisation workshops as well. And we also looked to begin to start to shape this into some kind of cohesive operatic experience and um, virtual reality is something where you really can only um stay in that kind of space for a, a certain period of time so the opera is going to be around 15 minutes in length that's one five minutes in length um any longer than that really and i think people start to get quite tired in the space um so obviously when there are all these people who are involved in the project trying to distill this down um and make something where people all feel like they're represented and the narrative of the piece and the, the design of the piece feels cohesive is a big challenge. And so that was part of what these sorts of sessions were about. And um, we did these sessions here, and then we also went across to Inish Mion and did similar sessions there. We also took some of the work that had been done in the sessions on the other side of the country, shared that with them and asked for their responses on those sorts of things. So there was this iterative process happening. You can see there in the bottom left, we've got sort of photos on the floor that had been generated the week before on the other side of the country. And we're asking people to respond to those things. Um, it was also at this point where um, we decided to turn to Irish mythology um, as a source of inspiration. Um, this is something that um, I myself and Francois have spoken about this, and I think it's quite interesting as a trend that happens in a lot of community opera is people turn to folk tales or uh, mythological tales or basically stories that are known to a broad uh, to a broad group of people. Um, having an original story that comes straight off off the bat um, uh, is something that is quite challenging, but for, for people to I think to deal with completely cold but if there's something that they can bounce off and they can work with that can be a lot easier um, you can say what is what it is that you don't like about this particular story or what it is that you do like about it um, and so we found mythology is a good way to kind of kind of work in that kind of way um, so through all that writing that had taken place in the workshops earlier on um, we had a variety of different themes that were coming through in the writing things to do with uh, migration, uh, themes to do with the water, um, to do with transformation, uh, with climate change. Um, so we spoke to a myth expert, a myth expert, um, and asked them uh, to share with us some some Irish myths that are sort of associated with with that particular um, with those particular themes. And we, we settled on four four myths and played around with those and combined them and tore them apart and used those as tent poles for us to then begin to build the narrative. Finally, after that period, we had um, a libretto. Um, that libretto went back and forth. Um, there were some challenges with it, which I'll talk about um, a little bit later on. Um, but we we do have a um, um, a narrative to the to the story. And to give you a, a kind of a loose synopsis of what that narrative looks like, um, it's effectively a um, uh, a story with three characters. Uh, one is Nalva, who is the captain of a ship. 
the other are the people on the ship, a collective of people on the ship. Um, and the third is a spirit called Dale. Um, the, the, Cap the Captain Nalva and the people on the ship, it's not clear where they've been, but they are looking to find new land. Um, uh, and we don't know why they've had to go in, in, in um, from where they were before. Um, and so they're at sea and they encounter Dale. Um, Dale is meant to be seen as, as the embodiment of carbon in the sense that carbon is a is a is an element that is um, is fundamental to life on Earth, but also uh, is also when misused um, can also be incredibly dangerous to the to, to the planet. Um, so it was about those sorts of encounters, um, and so Dale meets um, uh, meets these people and Nalva and plunges them underwater. Um, the, the the ship then gets dragged back out and they land on new land. They they they, they become washed up on new land um, uh, in a place that eventually flourishes. But then there is a moment in the in the opera where you you have the opportunity at, in this VR space to either reject or accept Nalva. But in doing so, um, you will trigger a different ending to the opera. So it's another interesting medium with virtual reality is that interactive element. That was something that Joe, the director, was quite interested in, in doing. Um, two sort of images there. That's one of the collage pieces that was created on the left. And this is an early design of, of, of one of the worlds. Um, and you, I think it's just a lovely comparison here. You can see some of that imagery there coming across into, into this, this digitally designed world here. So there's those sorts of things that are slowly, slowly happening with the piece. Um, so we, we're now at a point where um, uh, Fanola, the composer, is away writing um, this work and bringing all those those ideas together. Um, um, and we're also designing what the world will look like. We've partnered with a studio called Algorithm, who are a design studio based in, in Dublin, who are used to working in virtual spaces. Um, and so they're currently drawing sketches and building things into that world, which is really exciting to see that all come together. Um, I just thought I'd show you here an instance of um, of reference points from from two photos of the island of Inishmion. It's an incredibly beautiful place. If you ever are in Ireland and you're on the west coast, I'd really encourage you to go and, and visit the Aran Islands. Um, they're they're very unique. Um, there are very few trees on the island. Um, it's a very very stony um, uh, environment. So these kind of um, sort of pavings that you can see on the left hand side are very common. And so those are sort of a, a reference in, in some of the work. Um, uh, but we also didn't want we wanted to make sure this wasn't explicitly about Inishmion, um, uh, this piece, um, as I'll talk about um, now, um, because another key piece of feedback that we had um, and this came at a later point was was actually concerns about the darkness of the work. Um, uh, we uh, we shared a, 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 a what, what we thought was a, a relatively final libretto um, with with the um, uh, with the community uh, for some of them to then push back at that point and say actually there's certain aspects of this that we're really not happy with uh, and we'd like to see changed um, I raise this because I think this is a if, if you're working with communities um, one thing that I've learned from this process is about making sure that you're communicating with people on their terms and not on the terms that are most most comfortable for the company so we were firing off emails to to the community and saying you know this is what we've been doing um we hope you're happy with this and um, but that wasn't the way that most people are happy with communicating the other thing i'd say is that it takes time for communities to come back to you um it's not necessarily a case again this idea of feeling like you're working with a professional writer and you as a non-professional writer um what gives you the authority to stay um I don't like that. Um, well, you do have the authority because you know we're, we're, it's our egalitarian this process. Um, uh, but at the same time, I can understand why that's an intimidating experience for somebody. Um, so you know, we found certainly um, with some of the communities that they needed time to speak amongst themselves and f find if there is a consensus there. Um, those things are so specific to p particular communities. There's no one one fix to that kind of kind of stuff, but it's a complex and, 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 and challenging um, uh, aspect. Um, I'm going to play you a short video now um, uh, of, of another aspect of, of the work that we, we've, uh, we're, we're involved in as part of this. Um, uh, as part of virtual reality, there's a, there's a sort of a technical term known as assets, which is basically any item that appears within the virtual reality space. 
um, be that a character or a prop or whatever it is. Um, there's one scene when when the when the uh, boat gets plunged underwater where there are uh, fish and jellyfish swimming around. Um, our director Joe thought it'd be interesting to incorporate the movements of the non-professional participants into uh, the into the work. Um, so rather than having just an animated fish, it would be the actual physicality of certain people who are involved in the project as a way to kind of literally see themselves move in the piece. So here's just a short video um, about that. Out of the Ordinary or Asangana is very much a one-off project which is made with participants all over this country and they are involved in the creation of the music, in the creation of the narrative and even in the creation of the motion capture that will be part of the characters that are in our virtual reality world. Today I was in a motion capture suit um, acting as a jellyfish. It was just brilliant, exhausting. That's why I'm slightly out of breath. I've never seen anything like that before. I've never kind of been part of anything like it. And, you know, it's just like really cool. Like, I didn't even know you could do that. Seeing how everybody brings their own personality to the, the digital avatars is, is, has actually been a lot of fun. Quite an amazing experience and great fun. I've never done anything like it, but if anyone ever has the chance to do it, say, go for it. It's, it's great fun and it's a great workout as well. <laughs> Oh, I think it's amazing. It's like, it's just, it's such a great, like, group of people as well, just to be doing it with. And, like, you know, nobody, you people still, like, listen to you, because I thought nobody would be listening to me, because, you know, I'm a kid. But, like, it was really nice to be, have that sense, sense of, like, involvement and stuff. I, I absolutely love it, and it, it's opened my, my eyes to the, the whole, you know, process of, of, of putting on, you know, shows and theatre and... I absolutely love it. I wish I had done this 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> My smile must say it all. <laughs> so in terms of uh, our, our next steps with this work, um, uh, we're kind of in the, the final sprint of the production at the moment. The, um, the premiere um, of this piece will take place in early August. Um, and people will experience them in virtual reality headsets. Um, the individuals that you can see here are part of a, um, a choir called Tala Choral Society. Um, we are in the process at the moment of uh, uh, running rehearsals um, with this choir, as well as with a choir across on the other side of the country, who are forming part of a community opera as part of this, um, this work. Um, so they are in rehearsals at the moment and recording, and we're going to be recording um, their performances later in the year alongside the, um, the professional uh, performers. Um, the other thing that you can probably see on these headsets that we're having to think about at the moment is actually the... The, how clunky they are in the sense that that's putting something over your head like that and then having headphones strapped on top of you for someone who is coming to what is an artistic experience you want that to be a smooth process you don't want it to be something where people are constantly worried about you know whether they are they're wearing it right and all those sorts of things because it will take you out of that experience um so we're at the moment we're also thinking about how exactly that exp what that ex experience will look like so um we're, we're the idea is we're going to be producing sort of small um, uh, uh, bubbles for people to, to um, uh, interact in this space. We're removing any kind of um, handheld device that you have to use. You can see on the table there are certain um, devices that people usually use to kind of steer them around as if it was a video game. We're getting rid of those, so it's hand gestures only that should be able to um, and the movements of your heads that take you to those things. So it feels like a far freer environment. Um, this August will begin a tour round Ireland, um, and the view is is that next year we'll be bringing this work internationally as well. Um, it's going to go to every county in Ireland, which we're really really excited about, um, and uh, I hope it comes um, to a, a venue near you uh, in the near future. And if you're interested to, to have us, we'd be delighted to have you. Um, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm.